Thank you, everyone. You're all very compliant. It's wonderful. Um, you're, you're much better behaved than the folks that I uh, talked to on Mondays at noon at the Shaftesbury Luncheon that I uh, run over at the Locke Foundation. My name is Karen Palasek. Good evening. Welcome. I work for the John Locke Foundation, and I am the Director of Educational and Academic Programs there. And we are the point people, so to speak, for the Ralph McInerney Institute, which has brought you Michael Novak to speak tonight. So we're very, very pleased to have been able to facilitate this for them and to invite you here to hear the talk and get to ask some questions and interact a bit. And I hope you've had a chance to speak with each other and to meet and greet as well. Um, my introduction is going to be very, very short. I'm going to actually introduce the introducer, who is Christopher Wolf. And just a little bit about Chris. He's an emeritus professor of political science at Marquette University, currently is vice president of the Thomas International Pro uh, Project, and co-director of the Ralph McInerney Center for Thomistic Studies. He graduated summa cum laude from Notre Dame in 1971 with a major in government, and went on to study political philosophy at Boston College, receiving his PhD in 1978. Uh, he recently became the vice president of the Thomas International Project. And the aim of the Ralph McInerney Center, which Chris is going to talk to you about for just a minute, is to promote strong and accurate rereading of Thomas Aquinas's philosophy and theology, and at the same time to make Aquinas's thought fruitfully converse with contemporary culture, especially in the areas of bioethics, political and legal theory, economics, literature, natural sciences, and sociology. Um, so please uh, let me introduce Chris Wolf, and he's going to talk to you for a minute about the center and introduce Michael Novak. Really, in all justice, the first thing I have to do uh, tonight is to thank Karen and also Ashley and Melissa, uh, people at the John Locke Foundation who have done just a wonderful job uh, organizing the evening's event, and I'm, I'm very grateful to them. Uh, as Karen said, tonight's event is sponsored by the Ralph McInerney Center for Thomistic Studies, uh, which began well, probably about late 2004, and which tries to promote the classical Christian intellectual tradition, the Western tradition, uh, which is embodied in St. Thomas's thought, which is a kind of combination of, a, a synthesis of uh, the classical uh, Greek tradition, especially Aristotle, and also the fathers of the church and Roman and church law. And it was also a, a tradition that really tried to confront the major intellectual positions of its own time. So for example, there was a real confrontation with Arabic philosophy, which uh, Aquinas really provided leadership in. And in some way, we're trying to duplicate that in the modern world to represent the classical Christian intellectual tradition and to engage with uh, other strands uh, of thought in the modern world, uh, both Christian, uh, non-Christian religious views and, and secular views as well. Uh, and so the, I mean, the ultimate goal of the center actually someday in some far distant, uh, but we hope very real future, will be to become the nucleus of a new university and one that really tries to integrate uh, the technical achievements of the modern secular university, which are really wonderful, but to integrate that with moral and religious truths as well. And we think that one of the really big problems of contemporary higher education is a lack of unity. Students kind of drift through taking this course or that course, but without much that really integrates it or provides it with some kind of unified center. And that's the, the goal we, we would like to try to achieve someday. In the meantime, what the center wants to do is to promote the tradition by various kinds of activities, conferences, lectures, classes, I guess with a special focus on university education. Uh, we have some you know, absolutely first-rate institutions in this area, places like Duke and UNC and North Carolina State. And uh, you know, the, the whole triangle area really has a reputation for having a, a strong intellectual interest. Uh, at the same time, I think there's something we can add or provide in the area that isn't here as much. And as I say, that's this 
attempt to integrate much of the, the secular knowledge of the modern university with broader moral and religious truths uh, derived from you know, the classical Christian Western tradition. And that's going to be our goal for the, the foreseeable future. Uh, how much it's going to be here is still up in the air. Uh, we've been looking for a couple of years now for a permanent location for the center. Uh, and we looked at, at South Carolina last year, and, and one of the things that lacked was really the kind of deep intellectual interests that are characteristic of the Triangle area. And that's what's led us here, great library facilities, uh, a real intellectual interest. And so we're spending this academic year exploring Raleigh-Durham as a possible place for the center uh, for its permanent location. And uh, we've done a variety of activities this year. Robert George from Princeton spoke at Duke in October. A former State Department diplomat, uh, Tom Farr, spoke at UNC in November. Michael is kind enough to join us tonight and tomorrow to speak here and, and at Duke. And our next event, tentatively, is set for April 10th at probably at Duke. Uh, we're bringing in Robert Lewis Wilkin of the University of Virginia. Uh, and also Reinhard Herder of the Duke Divinity School to talk about higher education in the contemporary world and especially kind of what's missing at the really first-rate secular universities uh, that we're all familiar with. And so uh, I hope to have more definite information up on our website, uh, the, the address of which, the URL of which is located in the, the brochures that you have there. So I, Hope we'll have a chance to see you again uh, in the future, perhaps in April. Uh, I want to move now to uh, introducing Michael Novak. I guess the transition would be that Michael has been a, a remarkable friend of the McInerney Center from the very beginning, serving on its advisory board. And uh, he's a, a great person to have in that capacity, uh, per precisely because of his own background, because he is. Uh, He's one of these Renaissance men. You don't say he's this or that because he's so many different things. He's a, an author, a philosopher, a theologian uh, who doesn't just talk about the, the issues of one discipline, but really integrates many different things. Uh, I think one of the things that really stands out, for example, is that in, in the 19, late 1970s, I guess beginning then and through the 1980s, Michael undertook a project of trying to provide a theological defense of modern liberal democracy and capitalism. And for those of you, I think most of you, who can remember back to those days, uh, in the 1970s and 1980s, most of the intellectual world just assumed as a matter of course that capitalism was a kind of rotten, corrupt, dog-eat-dog -dog world, really inconsistent with, for instance, Christianity. And Michael undertook the project of providing a kind of theological defense of capitalism. He pointed out that only a non-capitalist academic could say that capitalists go around in a dog-eat-dog -dog world. I mean, the people who act that way don't usually succeed very well in business, right? I mean, who would trust them? You know, so Mike was able to elaborate a lot of the virtues of capitalism while also recognizing that, like every other system, it has its own tendencies that are dangerous that have to be dealt with. He also, together with people like Father Richard Newhouse and George Weigel, gave a, a broader defense of uh, American liberal democracy, uh, focusing on the, what they viewed as the three major, you might say, systems that are a part of any given society, because you have the, the political system, democracy, uh, and a, you have the, the economic system, in our case, you know, uh, a moderate capitalism, and then also the culture as well. And these three things need to reinforce each other. And Michael has been one of the great exponents of uh, a moderate, sensible, uh, liberal democracy as a kind of ideal form of government that, that we should really value while always trying to work to improve the, the ways in which it does have defects, because there's no such thing as a perfect form of government or a perfect society. And so that a kind of the role of the friendly critic, you know, defending the virtues and also pointing out the dangers has been one that he's served, uh, served in, as, in, a, in a really great capacity. Uh, I mean, there's so much I could say about Michael in terms of his general background. He's the author of, I think, 27 books. 
Uh, among the recent ones, I mentioned the spirit of democratic capitalism from the, the 80s. Uh, he did a book in uh, 2004 called The Universal Hunger for Liberty. In 2006, related to tonight's discussion, he wrote a book called Washington's God. And most recently, uh, he's written a, a book uh, that's really a kind of uh, dialogue with non-believers. There's a lot of kind of aggressive public atheism these days, people like Richard Dawkins, for example, and others. And he wrote, No One Sees God, The Dark Night of Atheists and Believers, uh, last year or 2008, a couple of years ago. So uh, you know, Michael has been uh, a really uh, a significant public intellectual in our life. Also the husband of Karen Laub Novak, uh, who uh, died recently last August and was a, a remarkable person, person in her own right as well, a painter, sculptor, printmaker, writer, and uh, a, a worthy consort of the, the Renaissance man uh, that we have tonight. Uh, finally, I should say just a, a word about Ralph McInerney because people may wonder who is this Ralph McInerney that the, the center is named after. Uh, Ralph is one of the great Thomists of the 20th century. He began teaching at Notre Dame in about 1955, and he taught there for 53 years. Uh, one of the real outstanding Thomistic thinkers of that period of time, perhaps the, the, the most significant in the Anglo-American world. And uh, at the same time, the author of a whole raft of mystery detective fiction. You know, he's the author of the, the Father Dowling series, uh, and uh, also had a, a nun who was a, a detective and he has a series based on Notre Dame as well. And he was, I can assure you, the world's best after-dinner companion. Uh, nobody was quite as witty as Ralph. Uh, life with Ralph was a pun every 30 seconds, and usually a, a very good one. And it's appropriate to talk about Ralph tonight, uh, well, for several reasons. First of all, he died 18 days ago, very recently. Uh, and it was a, a serene and a wonderful death. I'm sure he's, he's in heaven now. But also very uh, worthwhile mentioning because Ralph and Michael were very close friends and had collaborated on many projects together. And uh, that, that friendship was something that they both valued very much. So with that as an introduction, I just want to thank you all for being here tonight. Thank Michael especially for being here tonight and to say that uh, I look forward to meeting many of you uh, later tonight and on other occasions. Thank you all very much for having me. And uh, let me know if you're not hearing, because I have such a light uh, voice. Uh, Chris, I, I was disappointed in one thing. About my humility, you had nothing to say, uh, <laughs> legendary as it is. Um, and I wish my wife had been able to hear you praise me, because what she will do if she were here right after the lecture is tell me, I don't know why you kept dropping your voice at the end of sentences. <laughs> People couldn't hear you. Uh, my favorite joke in that respect is uh, Henry Kissinger received an award as one of the great men of the 20th century. And he and Nancy go home afterwards up to their Park Avenue apartment with the thick white rugs and uh, Henry mixes the martinis and they kick off their shoes and they're sitting there and Henry's swirling his martini, looking at the olive go round, and he says, I wonder how many great men there are in the 20th century. And Nancy swirls her martini so, and with the cool eye that only a wife can turn on a man, said, one fewer than you think, Henry. <laughs> <laughs> That's what wives are for. Uh, I, I can't forbear, it's, it's, I hope no one is embarrassed, but I can't forbear telling you the great story told about Ralph at the funeral luncheon afterwards, where everybody's telling stories. Ralph knew every stone at Notre Dame and every tree and every building. He loved the place. Uh, he didn't like the recent invitation of a certain president to Notre Dame at all, but um, one day, he, every day he'd take a constitutional, he'd take different friends with him. One day he was walking with a new professor at the law school named Jerry Bradley. 
And he, as they cross, cross the quad, he looks down at the far end and he's Rockne Gymnasium, 1972. That's what it was called then. He said, I'll never forget a dozen kids with bags over their heads running out of there with not a stitch of clothing on. And uh, Jerry said, they call that streaking, Ralph. Ralph said, interesting word. Jerry says, were they guys or gals? And Ralph said, I told you they had bags over their heads. I couldn't tell. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, he was unbelievable. <laughs> Dry as could be. Anyway, what a dear man he is. Um, I want to talk about it a reasonably difficult subject, but I'm going to take my, it's the Washington's day. I mean, it isn't, but it is, it really is, and Lincoln's. We're a lucky country. There's no other country in the world who treats their leaders, their presidents, as the greatest icons in their history. There's no movie star who compares to Washington or Lincoln. There's no hero of any kind, of literature or fiction or anything that compares with the statue, and you could throw in a few more. Um, Teddy Roosevelt, some would say, Franklin Roosevelt, um, Ronald Reagan. Uh, there are a bunch of them. And I mean, we're just so lucky to have such great people at, at intervals. Um, well, I was invited to a candlelight dinner with, I was invited to a candlelight dinner at Mount Vernon one October a few years back. And it's so beautiful there. It was out on the veranda where one can imagine Washington having had dinners and candlelight and sitting beside me was a man who looked like George Washington exactly uh, uh, in an 18th century costume and he talked 18th century language. It was just wonderful. Um, about 12 people or so, and um, as we were sitting, I'm saying, why was I invited? There is no such thing as a free dinner. And sure enough, afterwards, the executive director made a beeline for me, and he said, Michael, I'd like to talk to you a minute. He said, we, the book we get most requests for in the bookstore is a book on Washington's religion. And I don't have one I'd like to put in people's hands. And he said, I read your book on two wings uh, about the American founding, and I think you could do it. I said, oh, I can't possibly. I'm, I've got three books I've got to get done. And I said, let me think about it a while. I said, no, but I'll think about it. So a week later, I called him back and I said, okay, I'll do it. And one reason is my daughter, who's a brilliant young graduate of Duke, and speechwriter in the beginning for Newt Gingrich, uh, and um, then, you know, some senators, Senator, uh, what is her name, ba Bailey Hutchison from uh, K, K uh, in, of Texas, and then of Senator Brownback, and um, there's a congresswoman from Florida who was the longest, uh, uh, I mean, the, had most seniority among women in Congress, I can't quite, I have suffered from half Alzheimer's. I mean, half the time I just, I can see it there, but I can't quite, I have the same photographic memory I always had, but a lot less film. I mean, it just, <laughs> it just won't come. Um, so my daughter was not working, and so I called her, would she consider helping me write the book, because I didn't have time to do all the research necessary, and I could trust her to do it. So anyway, so the book uh, came to be. Now I had a theory that Washington was more religious than most people thought, but I was, I was not sure of this at all. I was basing it just on a hunch and uh, on having read some of his public official statements as general and as president. For example, uh, in his general orders, capital G, capital O, those formal notes that the commander-in-chief has to leave. Lincoln left here, they all did. Uh, July 2, 1776, the Declaration of Independence has just been voted on, and he writes to his men that, um, well, the important phrase is this, he says, 
you know, we're, this is the beginning of a new country. And under God, that's where that phrase comes from, on you depend the future of liberty in this land and for millions yet on board, on this army of 13,000 and a ragged uh, citizens, no military background, mostly had their own weapons. Um, an armed society, I've always thought, is a polite society. That's just, I'm throwing that in free. Um, that's funny, you're supposed to laugh at that. Uh, think of the courtesy of the 18th century and uh, chivalry and so forth. Um, anyway. Um, On July 9th, he ordered all his troops to be lined up. The text was now ready. At a service thanking God, which he ordered done every Sunday and as often as possible during the week. Everybody is on prayer ground and led by a minister in prayer. And uh, he says um, in it again, uh, you men under God are the only hope of liberty on this uh, continent and maybe in, in history. Uh, he loved those men and, and they loved him. And he kept them together through defeat after defeat after defeat. It's really tough for young men to go through a series of long defeats and not lose heart. Their wives, their children needed them at home on the farm. Uh, they'd need them in another month when the harvest came in. Somebody was sick. And um, they had to choose. And, uh, and more often than not, they stayed with the general. And, and chiefly because of him. He insisted that as an army, they must fight, his words, as Christian soldiers. Because how can we ask the blessings of God, of providence, on our cause if we don't follow his laws? I mean, what kind of action is that? And, um, and look, he counted a lot on divine providence. Um, we were making war on the greatest military power in the world, the largest army the largest and best navy. And we didn't even have a munitions factory on this side of the ocean, and we had no army and we had no navy. What did we have? We had a firm reliance on divine providence. Well, you're better if you don't have an army <laughs> and a navy or a munitions factory. And they thought, and they, I mean, they really argued this. It was argued out on, in the arguments for the Declaration of Independence. People said, this is irrational to do this. It's just wrong to do this when you don't have any way of winning, how can you lead so many people to be killed? And they argued that, I'm putting this in my words, but it's, it's a short way of saying it, look, the reason God made the whole commerce, the creator, the whole cosmos, and is so that somewhere in it there would be a creature, man and woman, to whom he could offer his friendship. It needed to be a creature that was intelligent and had judgment and could respond. And as William Penn put it in the first Declaration of Religious Liberty in the, in the colonies, my native state of Pennsylvania, uh, if, uh, if friendship, and of course it was the city of friends, Philadelphia, founded by the Society of Friends, the whole colony, if friendship, then liberty. You cannot have friendship without liberty. Friendship has to be freely given or it's servitude. It isn't friendship. Um, and so even though they both prayed to the same God, the British and the Americans, the Americans had confidence. It, even Tom Paine argued this. Tom Paine, the most anti-Christian, anti-Jewish writer of the time, maybe of many times. Um, pointed out in the darkest days of 1776 when they lost 11 battles in a row. Um, 
he pointed out that um, there was no way the God of liberty could favor the cause of that robber, George III, without violating his own nature. Now, they didn't think that the good guys always win. Look what happened to Jesus. I mean, if, if the father does that to his son, what's it going to happen to us? Uh, but on the other hand, they thought they had a good shot at it. If the purpose of history is to increase the domain of liberty, then we ask God to help us because that's what we want to do. I mean, that was the, that, that's the gist of the argument. Well, uh, I think what I, what I want to do at this point, I, just, I think I want to ground this very carefully. If you take the top founders, what I, w what I am writing about, what I'm arguing is that if you take the top 100 founders, and I would define them this way, those who signed the Declaration of Independence and those who signed the Constitution, there's some overlap, but not so much. Plus, throw in, that's about 80 people, throw in 15, 20 more, Abigail Adams, Tom Paine, um, George Mason, and a whole bunch of others. And uh, pretty important in the founding. And make the list 150 if you want, but a, a finite number. And just look at what their religious beliefs were and convictions as they wrote them, as they practiced them. Uh, you'll discover that they were remarkably religious people. The outlier is Thomas Jefferson. He's at the one extreme. Now, naturally, he's the one professors nowadays write about because most of them are not very interested in religion. They think the world is outgrowing it. And I, you know, that's roughly the way history goes in the last 75 years or so. Gordon Wood, the chief American historian, points out the error of that, that these men were far more religious than most people in the 20th century can understand. They're head of the U.S. Bible Society and you know, publishers of the Bible, and, I mean, all kinds of things. Leaders in their state, a number of them were ministers. Um, that's one part of my argument. If you just look, when you say, what was the founding of this country like? Were they deists? That means creator, full of intelligence and energy, who gets the whole thing moving. Um, and most people believed, you didn't have to be a Christian or a Jew to believe that, Aristotle, Plato, most people in history have believed in such a God. In fact, what's, what's really strange is atheism is an abnormal belief. The default position of the human race in old times and today is the vast majority of people are aware of being in the presence of God. It's not right to say they believe in God, that makes it sound like it's scientific theory. They are aware of God's presence in their lives. And um, what's abnormal is to have so many people at one time atheists. In fact, it's abnormal to even have one or two or three atheists. People say at the time of the American founding, there were no Americans who were atheists. Um, there were a good many who were deists or who were doubters, but not nearly so many as you think. Now, a deist, the thing about a deist God is he doesn't care anything about the human race. He doesn't care anything about nations. He doesn't care anything about persons. He doesn't get meshed in history. That's the mistake of Christians and Jews. They think that God gets intermixed in history, and it's not true. That's the deist position. Um, um, and I think the reason it was attractive to many people, even some Christians, was there was a hunger among Protestants I'm not talking the Anglican so much, but others, who tended to argue that scripture alone, and it, the Catholic mistake was to put too much emphasis on reason. But there was a great hunger for a better philosophical explanation, especially since you had many Protestant religions at the same time. Um, and so I think that the invention of deism by the scientists like Newton and others, it wasn't he that did it, but people thought that there, there's a way of going to God without Christianity, without the Bible, it's through philosophy, through science. And that joint love for both reason and, and scripture characterized the first American generation. What I heard a lecture the other day at Ave Maria University and uh, the lecturer characterized it as accidental Thomism. This is the most Thomist 
moment in Protestant history where the search for both reason and Jewish and Christian faith joined. And if you read the sermons of that period, many of them are collected. You know, the, the most educated people in the colonies were, were ministers. That's why Harvard and Yale were founded as divinity schools. I mean, heck, if you're going to have ministers preach at you for two hours, you want them to be good and know something. Um, and um, anyway, um, if you look at those sermons, it is astonishing how they consistently argue for liberty and argue for the American cause, basing it on two arguments. First, they argue from reason, and sometimes citing Locke, um, but more often citing, oh heck, I've forgotten his name just as I want it, uh, Sidney. Um, I think Sidney's the overlooked person in American history. And I, I don't want to insult the foundation, but I think Locke is slightly overrated as his importance to the founders. <laughs> I mean, he's very important to the history of liberty, don't get me wrong, but he is not so important to the American founding. Uh, there were not many copies of Locke in, the country, in this country at the founding. He wasn't published here. Um, and usually those were in the hands of ministers. Um, and then the country started to go downhill. We got more and more lawyers, and then it was in the offices of lawyers, you know, and um, I'm kidding. My father-in-law was a lawyer. He used to refer to me as his son-in-law, the celestial physicist. I had got my degree in history and philosophy of religion, and he did not see any income for his daughter in that, you know. He, 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 he was a bit opposed to me. Um, uh, but what I, what I want to do now is I, I want to make a second step in my argument. Not only looking at the faith of the fathers, where they, of our founders, were they deist? Or did they believe in the Jewish and Christian God? That's the argument. And I want to say, let's not look at what they did privately. Let's look at the official documents of the United States for the first 20 or 30 years. And I just want to cite one of them. This is a, a declaration of thanksgiving for the year 1789. There were several of them. They were enduring the War of Independence. There were several of them. And also days of fast and repentance, all originating in the Congress, in both houses of Congress, when there were two houses, uh, or in the Continental Congress, urging the president to declare national days. Now, just imagine if George W. Bush, popular as he was, had declared a day of fasting and repentance, penance, by all the American people. Wow! You can imagine. Um, it, it's more likely that Bill Clinton could have done it and got away with it, because he actually, literally, he talked about God a lot more than George W. Bush. But I, my own hunch is people didn't think he meant it, and so they weren't bothered. And the, the problem they had with George Bush is they were afraid he meant it. <laughs> so even though he spoke less, they didn't like it. And uh, well, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to make a partisan point, not in an organization like this. Um, so here, I'm just, I'm just using for a moment one document. Um, voted on by the con both houses of Congress, pushed on the president to, and you know, if you're a president and both, you have both houses of Congress telling you to do something, on the whole, you better do it. Um, and here's the way it goes. I mean, believe this. I mean, how many people today, put it this way, how many professors at the University of Virginia, how many professors at the Duke Divinity School would say this? Whereas it is the duty of all nations to acknowledge the providence of Almighty God. Now, I, to be truthful, I hesitate on the duty of nations because I try to imagine how does a nation do this, especially if it's composed of different people of different backgrounds and religions and so forth. But any, this is what they believed. That, that's my point, whether we believe it or not. Whereas it is the duty of all nations to acknowledge the providence of Almighty God. That's one thing, acknowledge the providence. And providence means a God who intervenes in history. 
It means a God who cares about particular nations and particular people. I mean, he cares about everybody. But he has different tasks. For, you know, the Poles believe they're a providential nation. And their providence has been to suffer, <laughs> to be run over from east and west and south and north, and, uh, and to suffer through it and keep their identity and keep their faith. And you know, so it goes around the world. Uh, but the Americans believed they were chosen by providence to spearhead the advance of liberty among human beings and, and what we came later to call human rights. Now, that may have been crazy, but that's what they believed. Okay, so that's the providence. It's our duty to acknowledge the providence of Almighty God, intervening regularly in our history, to obey his will. Imagine that, to obey his will. To be grateful for his benefits, not so hard to imagine. Most people spontaneously are. In fact, it's one of the hardest things for atheists is actually not to give thanks on a beautiful May day. Um, Jean-Paul Sartre writes a book on atheism, and, and he, it's his opening line, uh, something like, uh, it is exceedingly difficult to be an atheist. I constantly find myself in an unguarded moment thanking God uh, for this or that, and I have to resist and remind myself there really isn't any God. And, uh, so to being grateful to God is not so hard. Um, and humbly to implore his protection and favor. That means a God who has favor. I mean, he favors some people, some causes, and he protects them. And humbly to implore his protection and favor, and whereas both houses of Congress have by their joint committee requested me to recommend to the people a day of public thanksgiving, you know, I, I do it. And he says, this is a day, a prayer and thanksgiving, to be observed by acknowledging with grateful hearts. Now let me ask you this. What kind of God is it that cares about what's going on in your heart? And the Roman gods didn't. I mean, Roman philosophers could go and do incense and kneel down and whatever you had to do to the Roman gods. They did it on pietas, piety, just to show they were not going to violate the traditions of their people. They didn't have to believe it. Just do it. How many religions in the world of the world religions are there care about what's going on in spirit and in truth and in conscience? Not many. I don't think that's Buddhist because there's not an idea of God, really. It's dubious whether there's a God. Spirit, maybe. Spirit's not the right word. Enlightenment, maybe. But that could be impersonal, unfeeling. Um, Hindus, no. Muslims say they do, but to be truthful, I don't believe it. Because um, they believe in such unity between politics and religion that you, you cannot separate them. They're beginning to, and I think that's crucial. Uh, I know a lot of you, I'm sure, don't support the Iraq war, but I am a great supporter of it. And I think one of the greatest things that, that's going to come of it is the Constitution of Iraq goes further than any Islamic constitution in opening up space for liberty and limiting the clergy to a role outside of government. Um, that's going to be extremely important in the future. And there are more, more things I could say about it. But I think something historically has gotten rolling, has gotten rolling there, which is going to overtake one Muslim country after another in, during the next 50 years. Um, Maybe I'm wrong about it, but you know history will tell. Um, and here's so he says, uh, with grateful hearts for the many signal favors of Almighty God. You get that word again, signal. It's like a lighthouse. They stand out. How how can you ignore them? And he goes on to say. Um, that we may then all unite in rendering unto him our sincere and humble thanks for his kind care and protection of the people of this country previous to their becoming a nation. In other words, while Washington was general. And 
independence was had to be won took seven years and and then they had to form a constitution and really constitute a nation um, for the signal again that word and manifold mercies and the favorable interpositions of his providence there's that word again God intervened he he put himself into history on our behalf and he says next which we experienced in the course of the recent war for Washington this is not a belief we lived through it a couple examples well one I'll stick to one example Battle of Long Island in August of 1776 Washington had just won an incredible victory in Boston, completely unexpected. And he forced the British fleet, hundreds of ships, out of Boston Harbor with a couple of thousand men. And certain things happened, little things happened that made it possible. He thanked Providence for it. He comes down to marches his men down to New York as fast as they can because the British fleet has left Boston on their way to New York 350 ships and New York is scared to death they're gonna and by the way New York was the most pro-British town in the country uh, New York is tend to be anti-war uh, and um, yeah <laughs> the Bronx after the immigrants got there the Bronx was the salvation of New York you got it <laughs> You got it. Uh, 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 um, Archie Bunker's home place. Um, salt of the earth. Um, and uh, Washington made a horrible mistake. He had never led an army. He would led an army of 400. He had never led an army of 13, 15,000. And he got worried that the British would sail up the Hudson, but they had that pretty well protected from New Jersey, and you know they had guns. And but he realized they could sail up the East River on the other side of Manhattan, and there were no defenses. So he sent a group of men, half his army, over to start providing defenses against the British fleet. He forgot one thing: the British had ships, and they could go outside his line to where Kennedy Airport is now, land behind him and capture his men between the East River and the British Army. And they did. Washington didn't find out about it till the night before it was, the vice was to close. So he, he thought that was providential. But he ordered his men to find every boat and barge and, and um, what do you call them, raft they could find to get across the river. It would all be over, don't you understand, if they lost? It's only August. And the War of Independence would be over if he lost those men. And it was his fault. Um, and by daylight, they had fewer than half the men off. They, he ordered fires to be kept burning in the trenches so the British would think they were there. Uh, it was pouring rain. It was pouring so heavily that they couldn't see. They had to put their hands on one another's shoulder to get across. And the winds were so high on the river that when you rode, uh, you, you'd go ahead two, you know, two feet, let's say, and come back a foot. So by daylight, less than half the army was across the river. But a huge yellow fog rolled in, covered the river, so it made it even harder for the men. They had to get horses on these rafts and that too, to get across. And the fog lasted till between 11 and 12 in the morning. It's August. Uh, it's been a lot of daylight already. Uh, would have been. And the last man gets off. And now, you don't think Washington thought that was a signal interposition of divine providence. But he had a very, very sophisticated argument for it. He did not necessarily think that was a miracle. I mean, I lived for five years on Long Island. It does not take a miracle to have a thick yellow fog over the East River in Long Island in the morning. I mean, that's the way it starts most mornings. But the timing was wonderful. And according to the sermons and the ministers who spoke in those days, first of all, providence is inscrutable. You can't read it. And very often it punishes the good. 
And if you believe in Providence as Washington did, you think there's something to be learned from that? We're being taught a lesson by that? And so all those defeats, you know, he kept the spirits of his men up. Because if you believe in a gracious Providence, you shouldn't feel defeated ever. And you're not defeated till you're defeated. And um, so that's one reason he believed in Providence. He thought it was great in defeat. And it was great in victory because it prevented you from taking too much joy and pleasure. If you got victory, it wasn't due to you entirely. You'd have a lot of things go your way. So you had plenty of room to thank God for that. So don't get too elated in victory. Don't get too dejected in defeat. thought that's wonderful for an army. Um, but um, what I want to stress now is this vivid sense of his that these signal inter they, his favorite general Benedict Arnold was about to betray West Point to the British. If the British got West Point, the war would be over because they'd cut off the Hudson, cut off the North from the South. The British would. And then they'd just take the North and take the South or the other way around. And um, Arnold's courier to lay out the practical steps of how this was to be done was entrusted to a single rider who happened to be you know, racing across at night and he happened to be intercepted by a random American patrol with the documents in his hand. So Washington had it in cold writing in the hand of Benedict Arnold. And they were able to take measures to prevent it being carried out. Of course, the British never got the instructions, the practical instructions. Washington praised God in one of his Thanksgiving days of justice for that, that providential discovery in the nick of time. Anyway, um, look, you don't have to believe in Washington. You don't have to believe in anything if you don't want. But I think history demands that you see that these gentlemen and women did not believe in a deist God, but in a God who intervened in history. There is no other way. I can give you massive evidence of that, massive. I mean, I think you have to be blind not to see it. One other little thing, it's, it's, I, I, find, I, I love it. While a good number of males were deists, or like, they were Christians, but they toyed with deist philosophy. I mean, they liked the philosophical, almost no women were deists. Deists liked the concrete stories, the human stories of the Bible, much, much better. It makes good sense to me. Um, but then I'm just a rotten, um, I don't know what, chauvinist pig, I guess is the right expression. I, I happen to believe there's a difference between men and women, and you know, that's risky to say on a university campus, as the president of Harvard found out. Um, <laughs> and then the last, please allow me to make one more point with this, because it, it's, it's such a rich mind. And, I mean, the sophistication, the theological sophistication behind this, you, you could read texts in Thomas Aquinas that would apply directly to this. But of course, the Protestant divines of Harvard and Yale and Princeton, they were called the Protestant scholastics. And they had learned this tradition, or they called it natural theology. You had to take course in natural theology, and he had to give a disquisition on natural theology in order to get a degree from any Ivy League college. Um, anyway, uh, this is the last part. Um, and they, he's praying God to render our national government a blessing to all the people. And he goes on for the other things he asks of, they ask of God, the just and constitutional laws discreetly and faithfully executed and obeyed, and to guide all sovereigns and nations, especially those that have shown kindness to us, he means France. And um, and to promote the knowledge and practice of true religion and virtue. Notice that the little phrase, true religions. No doubt there are false religions. Now, this is not a matter of feeling. It's not a matter of indifference. You've given a brain and you can discern true from false. I mean, this is just very important to them. 
I mean, they disagreed on what was true, that, no doubt about that. But that in, uh, eventually made them humble and say, we can't impose, in a free republic like ours, we can't impose the faith of any one on the others. Um, you have to respect the conscience of each. But you don't give in to indifferentism, you don't argue. I feel this way, you feel that way. That, that's nihilism, that's relativism. That, route li that road, down that road lies tyranny. Because you can't tell the true from the false, you can't tell the just from the unjust. How can you protest against a tyrant? You know, you're a tyrant, it's unjust. That's your opinion. I mean, you know. Um, uh, and to promote an increase of science among us. Okay, and to bless them with good government. Uh, that's what he asked God to do. God bless America. And where do we get the hymn from? Except this belief that God blesses nations and protects them. Now, I, I, it's not part of my lecture tonight, but if I could, I would go on and show how what the founders argued for was neither separation of church and state nor union of church and state, but cooperation between them. Because the freedom needs both. And Friedrich Hayek made the same point in establishing the Mont Pelerin Society in Switzerland after the, after the war. He wanted to bring together a meeting of all the most distinguished people who believed in liberty. And there were lots of lawyers and economists and so forth, but he said, we need the presence of religious people, people of faith, or we will fail. And he understood that, you know, the leadership of the Pope, Pius XII at that time, in regenerating Christian democracy, promoting democracy and human rights, was defeating the communists in country after country. And he said, we're not going to succeed without those people, too. And Frank Knight of the University in Chicago, oh, he, uh, Hayek proposed it to be named the Acton Tocqueville Society. And Frank Knight of the University of Chicago stood up and said, I'll be damned if I belong to an organization named for two Catholics. Uh, uh, so they, they changed the name to the Mont Pelerin Society. But it's Hayek's speech there that is so significant and is very much in the American pattern. I call my other book on two wings, meaning it's on common sense, reason is common sense, and on humble faith that the American eagle took flight. It could not have flown without both of those. Religion alone wouldn't do it, because you needed all the lessons of the Enlightenment. But Enlightenment wouldn't do it, because this was not a rational undertaking they were undertaking. They had a belief that goes beyond reason, namely that the purpose of human existence is liberty, and that the direction of history is toward liberty. There's a providence. There's, the world has a beginning, and it has an end, and it has a direction. The whole idea of providence is Jewish and Christian. It's not Greek, it's not Roman. Uh, and our founding generation understood that. Well, um, you know, I had this all written out, and I've already covered most of it. Um, I, I want to tell at least one story about Washington. There, there are many. Um, remember, above all, he, the word he used most often for providence is inscrutable. When the daughter of his daughter through adoption, he had no children of his own, but Martha's daughter had a baby. And at something like eight days old or eight weeks old or something, it died. Washington loved Nellie, and he loved this little child. They were there at Mount Vernon. And he could not understand how such an innocent and beautiful creature uh, could fall prey to, I don't forget what flu it was or whatever it was. Uh, and eight times that happened in his life, the children of best friends of his, people closest to him died. And he would write letters. And he would say things which he did in his public statements too. Uh, a, a reasonable man can only say that providence is inscrutable in its intentions. And there's nothing we can do but bow before the sovereign will of providence. 
It's the only reasonable thing to do. Well, again, you don't have to believe that. I just think it's important to understand what got these people through the defeats and sufferings of 1776 and thereafter. Um, but also, uh, Washington was, was animated by a, uh, this sense, of, his favorite phrase was uh, the gracious providence. We're under a gracious providence, meaning that it, it works out somehow for good. Not that everything works toward good. He wasn't that kind of a, um, you know, shiny-eyed optimist, bright-eyed optimist. He knew there was a lot of suffering and a lot of evil. But he did believe that free people had a chance. You get a time at bat. No, no guarantee you'll win. Facing the Japanese and the Germans, there was no guarantee we'd win. But the American people knew we had a chance at bat, and we would do our best. If we failed, it wouldn't be because of us. I think this is the first time in our history. Am I not right about this? This is the first time in history when Americans have good reason to doubt ourselves. Even if we could win, do we have the stamina in the country as a whole? Is the country prepared for a long struggle and doing all the things that are necessary for that struggle? Um, I think this is the first generation in history where we doubt that about ourselves. Um, anyway, Washington uses the word providence himself once in a very vivid time, again through a mistake of his. He was no brilliant uh, tactician or strategist, uh, fighting with General Braddock in western Pennsylvania, near my hometown as a matter of fact. He had a big army, I mean, up to a couple thousand. And they were set upon by a small band of French and Indians, but totally by surprise. It wasn't often that Washington was caught in ambush. That was his job, um, but they were. And Washington had two horses. What they were doing is picking off at the officers. The officers were on horseback. And the sharpshooters, especially the Indians, were going at the officers. And um, Washington had two horses shot out from under him and remounted each time. After the battle, he had four bullet holes in his uh, jacket and two in his hat. And he said afterwards in a letter to his brother, in effect, he didn't put it Mark Twain's way, but it was like this, you know, uh, reports of my death are exaggerated, you know. <laughs> uh, but by the hand of a divine providence, I am alive today. Now, but this had an interesting effect. This is a story that's told and retold. To, I'm not certain it's true. Um, but an Indian who, took part, who was a chief, of a petty, you know, small chief in a little group, later became a more important Indian of that part of Pennsylvania. And he said, as Washington was president, that he himself had had, Washington was tall. I mean, he was six foot three, six foot four. He was the best dancer in the United States, according to Abigail Adams, who was very critical of Thomas Jefferson and others. She was not bowled over by fame. And, um, and he was also the best horseman in America. Everybody said that. Uh, but he, he um, was highly visible. And this Indian chief said he himself never missed. And he had 11 shots at George Washington and never hit him. He said, I always believed that he was protected by the great father in the sky, whatever the Indian expression was, and was intended for great things. Again, I don't know if that's little, literally true, but he did, the Indian chief did say that. Whether it was myth-making after the fact, I couldn't tell you. But the truth is, they had lots of shots at him, and he was the only, the only officer left alive at, at the end of that battle. Um, now, one more occasion I want to tell you, I want to tell you, because you have to see the effects of his sense of providence on his behavior. And one thing his men loved about him is he did not fear danger. And um, one time, um, one time, again in this battle in Pennsylvania, before he became head of the, the American army, where he was still fighting for the British, um, Washington had convinced the British with great difficulty that they needed to send out scouts on both sides of the army. You couldn't just march through the forest in rank, in red jackets, the way the British did. 
And General Braddock said, what do you know about armies? Um, but Washington finally got him after some bad experiences to send out flanking. One night, his two flanking units encountered one another in the dark and were shooting at one another. And when Washington grasped what happened, he got, in a, he got his horse going right away, went right down between them, yelling at them to stop and lifting up their, their uh, rifles with his sword. Um, sorry. Um, um, that's going to go off, I think. Um, so again, I mean, his men just were astonished. One more example of how he, he just doesn't seem to get hurt. And he, um, and they loved him for that. That, that army would have gone anywhere that he went. Uh, and for years afterwards, that Continental Army became the backbone of American democracy. These were guys who had shed blood, who had friends who lost their farms or whatever. And they did it by sticking together under impossible odds. And they were absolutely committed to Republican government and to religious liberty, the two causes for which Washington, about which Washington spoke most. And one other occasion, this is in, in Princeton. Um, his men turned in flight from the British, as most people fighting the British did. I mean, the British stood kne kneeling down, medium and tall, three rifles. And they all fired at once. They just they laid down a wall of fire. I mean, the man couldn't stand in front of that. So the army broke. You, you can appreciate it. And uh, Washington was really furious. Later in life, he was, it was said that he had such a calm, serene, majestic manner. He didn't when he was young. Uh, what, what serenity he learned was learned the hard way. And so he's yelling at them, and he, he turns them around and gets them going in the other direction. He goes in front of them on his horse. And the British break this time and start fleeing. And Washington is heard shouting out, way ahead of his troops now. Uh, it's a fine fox chase, my boys. You know, and finally, some of his aides catch up to him and stop him and bring him back before he's picked off by a sharpshooter. I, I'm telling you, I mean, this, uh, what I learned from, from Jan and I both learned from our work. And Jan used to say, you know, working in the Congress for 10 years and then studying this man, she said, what a come down <laughs> the current day was. Where was anybody around who, who was like Washington? And um, um, well, I just, I just want to give you a, a quick thing, and I want to do one more thing, and then I'll quit. Um, you won't believe what I'm saying, but this is Lincoln in 1863. Now, remember, this is before the Gettysburg Address, and it's a year before his second inaugural. I wish I could read it all to you, because it's so beautiful. Um, He calls it, I mean, it's a proclamation appointing a national fast day. Imagine if in the middle of the Iraq war, George Bush had declared a national day of prayer, observance, and fast. Wow. Um, whereas the Senate of the United States, devoutly recognizing the supreme authority and just government of Almighty God in all the affairs of men and nations, has by a resolution requested the president to designate and set apart a national day, day a, national, a day of national prayer and humiliation. And now listen to this, it's almost like Washington. And whereas it is the duty of nations, as well as of men, to own their dependence upon the overruling power of God, to confess their sins and transgressions in humble sorrow, yet with assured hope that genuine repentance will lead to mercy and pardon, and to recognize the sublime truth announced in the Holy Scriptures and proven by all history, that those nations only are blessed, whose God is the Lord. Imagine saying that today. Um, and inasmuch as we know that by his divine law, this is one sentence, I'll stop, but it just goes on and on. As, and it is as much as we know that by his divine law, nations like individuals, are subjected to punishments and chastisements in this world. I mean, I, that thought crossed through my mind on September 11th. 
and I must say I felt the last 20 years or so have been very dicey. I thought we've been clo floating very close to descending to such a low point of culture and virtue that you could not ma maintain Republican institutions. It would be hard to make free men and free women. As Madison said, how can a people who cannot govern their own appetites practice self-government? If they cannot govern themselves in private, how can they govern themselves in public? And, um, you know, John Adams said much the same thing. Uh, a nation intent on violating all moral laws is on the way to slavery. And tyranny. Tyranny is the word he used. Um, so I just wanted to, to read that so you see that this is almost 100 years later, not quite, four score and seven years later. And, uh, and here it is again, the same refrain. You cannot say this is a deist prayer. Forgive us our, you know, our sins, our transgressions. We're going to fast and repentance. That's insane before an impersonal God, or if there is no God. Um, and then, we, may we not justly fear that with the awful calamity of civil war, which now desolates the land, may be but a punishment inflicted upon us for our presumptuous sins to the needful end of our national reformation of a whole people. We have been the recipients of the choicest bounties of heaven. We have been preserved these many years in peace and prosperity. We have grown in numbers, wealth, and power as no other nation has ever grown. But we have forgotten God. We have forgotten the gracious hand which preserved us in peace and multiplied and enriched and strengthened us. And we have vainly imagined in the deceitfulness of our hearts that all these blessings were produced by some superior wisdom and virtue of our own. Intoxicated, we have become too self-sufficient. And, and, you know, then they go on to say they need God to heal the wounds of the war and to reconcile the two warring parties and to see that this war was necessary or we would not have understood the purpose of the Union or ended slavery. Um, I mean, these are astonishing acts of faith and very real. And Lincoln, Lincoln was the most reviled president in American history. If you think George Bush was reviled, go back and read the newspapers about Abraham Lincoln. Take it on my word, it was worse. In fact, I would say, you know, um, George Bush was only the second most reviled president in American, American history. Uh, and he was pursuing a war which was very unpopular. And you know, we had hundreds of thousands of casualties. How can a man alone in his office, practically the only man convinced, keep going? And Lincoln did. Um, I think much to the benefit uh, of us all. Well, I'm trying to say that I, I subscribe to the view that um, you cannot have liberty without virtue, meaning good habits, self-control, self-government. And you cannot have virtue, at least for the majority of the people, um, except for belief in a just God who would demand an accounting of our behavior um, and from whom we cannot hide, who's undeceivable. Um, and I think that's the root of our blessings. That's the root of our courage. Um, that's the root of the strength of the American people. And as I was starting to say, in the last 20 years, I thought it's touch and go. It's just touch and go which way we tip. And I must say, I thought this year, it's over. Why should God bless America? It's over. And then those Tea Party people started. And I don't want to start a political argument, but I just want to tell you, I thought this is, this is Boston all over again. This is the War of Independence all over again. This is the American people at their best. And um, we're coming back. And um, that's the most encouraging sign I've seen in a long time. I used to say that on Mondays, Wednesdays, and Fridays, I thought we're on the threshold 
of the wealthiest, most free era in world history. And on Tuesdays and Thursdays and Saturdays, I would think we're doomed. We're just going downhill in a spiral. And on Sundays, I would pray. Uh, well, um, that's still a pretty good practice, but the, the point is, uh, it's a touch and go thing. Uh, what was that sentence? Uh, uh, nations like individuals are subjected to punishments and chastisements in this world. My good friend Claire Booth Luce used to say, no good deed goes unpunished. Uh, well, anyway, I, I apologize for going on so long, but uh, thanks very much for your attention. <laughs> I know some of you have to leave and so forth, so please, it, it, it's no, uh, no uh, bother to me if you do. Yeah. Um, Michael Moore, is this on? My question is, uh, which theologians of the day uh, would have had Washington had a, had a big impact on Washington? Um, well, um, I had the privilege of going up to Boston to the uh, what is the name of the library where his books are kept? I can't remember. It's a special library dedicated to him. One of the descendants of Washington, collateral descendants, offered up his library for sale. And the bid, highest bid came from Great Britain. And when some people at Harvard and Boston generally heard of this, they said, these books are not leaving America. And so they asked for funds from the people. They took up a subscription to raise enough money to outbid the British. And they kept the library. Now, there are over 900 books. This is a man with the equivalent of about a fifth grade education formally. But loads of books on agriculture about how to improve the yield of his crop and so forth, how often to plow, how to rotate, and all this. And then about a dozen books on Providence. And then some books that his mother gave him. And I have the titles in the book. I can't remember them. Um, but if you go through them, there are some wonderful passages about how providence is inscrutable, how it is responsible both, both for good and for evil, but don't be affrighted by either one. God is almighty, and he will bring good out of evil. You may not see how. It may take some generations to see. Um, but that's, that's the law of the universe. And, um, you know, get used to it. I used to tell my kids when they were little, one would scream, that's not fair. You gave more to, more to her than to me. I said, get used to it. <laughs> Life is not fair. You know, just uh, take it from me. Um, um, if you expect equality. Um, look, the Lord promised Israel a land of milk and honey. Said nothing about oil. I mean, it's the only country in the region that doesn't have oil. You know? <laughs> Our God is not an equal God. <laughs> so uh, anyway, uh, the author of that book, I don't remember, but it's a commentary on the Book of Common Prayer. And it's just brilliant. I mean, it's old fashioned, but, but deep and wise. And then there were people like Witherspoon, the president of Princeton, who was probably the greatest theologian in the United Kingdom and persuaded by, took three delegations, the people from Princeton to, to, persu to persu persuade his wife. Uh, Chesterton said, a married couple is a four-legged creature with one will, and it's hers. <laughs> <laughs> and she didn't want to come to America, but they finally persuaded her that he was needed here, and he came to take over the University of Princeton after the death of Jonathan Edwards, the greatest theologian in our history. Um, and Witherspoon was a member, if I remember right, of 53 different committees of the Congress during the War of Independence. He was one of the great stalwarts in every dimension. And um, he gave a brilliant sermon on Providence in May of 1776. Devout, loyal subject of the king. He said, I never do this 
in a church service, but I must today and I crave your pardon. And he came out for the independence of the United States, made an argument for the independence of the United States. I never thought I'd say this, never thought I'd bring it up in a church, but our national survival is at stake. Our survival as a free people is at stake. That's the way to put it. And he was a great defender of civil and religious liberty from the perspective of the, of the Scottish common sense philosophers. And um, he would be one. And then Washington had two volumes of collected sermons on Providence. Ministers used to send them. And when he found one he particularly valued, he would set it aside and have them bound in books. They're wonderful reading. Very sophisticated, very wise, not simplistic in the least. They did not think Providence was Pollyannish and always blessed the good. It, it just doesn't work that way. Yeah. Are there other questions? I don't mind talking about other subjects too. You know, I'm, I'm, I've written on a number of different yes. themes. Please. please. Why aren't these stories of the founding generation better known? Why aren't we parents passing them on? And why don't we demand our schools teach them? And well, how do we turn it around? Because I, for one, am tired of the contempt I see expressed by Native people here that don't love our country and see it is a very exceptional country. Look, this is the first generation of young people, I'm talking about since the 60s, who have been taught that their country is on, on balance evil oppressive, um, chauvinist, racist, sexist. I mean, that isn't the way Americans were brought up in the past. And it chiefly comes from the universities and the failure of universities um, to honor and cherish our founders. I mean, you have to have a foundation to uncover the riches of John Locke, who was extremely important in the founding of this country, and he's not known. Also, this country is, this, our system is the most fragile of all systems because a free republic depends on ideas. You have to understand 10 or 12 counterintuitive points to understand the kind of liberty we have. And if a single generation forgets them, it's turn off the lights. You know, the country perishes with those ideas. So every generation has to relearn the lessons of the founding, and we have not been teaching them. It used to be in McGuffey's readers. Parents didn't have to worry about this, just send kids to school. And every day they learned a new story about Betsy Ross and you know, everybody else, um, Abigail Adams. And you know, they learned these stories about John Adams as the father of independence and, and Madison as the father of the Constitution, unlike uh, um, Giscard d'Estaing in France, who praised Jefferson as the father of the U.S. Constitution. I mean, you know, the Americans are as ignorant as he was about it. So I think that's a crucial, crucial point. And uh, there are some foundations now that are beginning to turn their attention to that, uh, and they they believe that the most urgent need of the country is to um, recover knowledge of our own political cultural history. I, I, I firmly believe that. You think parents can do something too at the dinner table? Uh, sure, trips but to the library? but I mean, but maybe I sound small about that. No, 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 like no. It, that's where it all begins. You're absolutely right. I mean, Tocqueville points out that in, there are two things about America that are extraordinary. One is the degree of fidelity to the marital bond. So that there's a greatest greatest deal of respect for women, much greater than in France, in which he says nobody trusts the matrimonial bond. And if you can't have honesty in your own bedroom, how can you have honesty in a republic? Nobody trusts government. And so one of the great reasons why people in America have trust for government is there's trust in their private lives. And, um, and then secondly, he points out that this uh, role of dignity and uh, liberty afforded to women, I mean, just commonly everywhere, um, I think Sarah Palin's image of this. I mean, any woman who starts the day fishing in the cold Alaska <laughs> waters, spends the afternoons hunting moose, and the late afternoons preparing moose dinner for, I'm, that's the old American kind of woman. I mean, standing there with a shotgun in the cabin, you know. Um, uh, anyway, uh, but that's where liberty begins. 
if you learn these lessons at your mother's knee or at your mother's homeschooling, <laughs> they stick with you for life. Now, there's a whole burst of writing by, by um, young historians about the American founding. David McCullough, this magnificent book, 1776. Read it, read it, it's terrific. In his book on John Adams, in the movies on John Adams. And you know, there's more appearing on every one of the, there's a resurgence of interest in the founding. And so the stories are becoming available. And they're there, people learn liberty by learning heroes and heroines. They learn them by human stories, just the way as we learn from scriptures by the stories. Um, Okay. One quick final question here. That brings up the question that I have and the fact that they're not letting us have heroes anymore. Uh, you look at what they've done with Thomas Jefferson as an example, and they're doing it with the others. Where did that start? Did it start in the universities where they're not teaching us what we ought to, to learn? Or, or what's brought about this need to tear down? Well, here's what I think. I think that... Um, a new class of people emerged in America beginning in the late 1930s that never existed before. We suddenly gained means of national communication. Radio came. Um, Henry Luce had his people invent a new ink so that you could print the magazine on late Friday and mail it on Saturday and the ink wouldn't smear. It was impossible before we had a national magazine. And we later had national television, and we had national newspapers, New York Times, Washington Post, LA Times, a few others. Um, and suddenly there was a class of people telling stories about America. And they had an extraordinary proportion of unhappy marriages and divorces. And I remember once I worked for Time Magazine briefly and the 10 or 12 people who had served in the London Bureau 10 years before had a party. Not a single one of them was married to the same spouse. Uh, I mean, that's their lives. Uh, almost no one in the Washington press knows anybody who's pro-life. They don't cover the pro-life march. because Nobody they know thinks it's important. I mean, they just live in a different world. And I think their own lives do not make them entirely proud. And so they, like pygmies, they have to pull down the giants. And look, every giant is flawed. It's not that you can't find flaw. There are real flaws. Uh, Abigail Adams despised Jefferson more than anybody you'll know today. <laughs> Washington had proof in his pocket that he was a liar. He asked Jefferson a direct question, and Washington had in his own pocket a handwritten letter from Jefferson that Jefferson said he had nothing to do with these hostile stories about John Adams, against whom he was going to run in the next auction. And Washington had in his pocket a copy of the letter he had sent to this editor in Maryland trying to get him to publish these stories. So, you know, he lost all, Jefferson lost all credit in his. So I'm not saying these guys are, nobody's perfect. The point of a wife is to point that out to you. Uh, I mean, I tell my students that, a line from Thomas Aquinas, that the most wonderful of all friendships is marriage. And I tell my students, that's true. But if you don't like honesty, don't get married. It's too expensive to live with conceits and illusions. And after about eight weeks of marriage, it becomes the duty of each spouse to tell the other all the things about themselves they don't want to hear. Um, and then if you have children, they continue it <laughs> for another 20 years. Yeah. Well, Michael has told us a lot. Of so you want to hear, and we're very grateful for it. Thanks. Thanks a lot. Thanks.